Hi everyone, welcome back to the second part of chapter nine, talking about the hydrosphere. We're gonna pick back up um, talking about groundwater. So groundwater, um, like it sounds, is liquid water that's underground. As you can see by this hole here, in most places, um, if you dig deep enough, you will eventually hit water. Some places you have to dig um, farther than others. Um, most precipitation actually ends up here. So a sum amount of it flows over land, um, flows into rivers, but most of it will flow underground um, and wind up in underground storage. Um, and this is most of the world's liquid fresh water. Um, so not including uh, glaciers, obviously, which is not liquid, but this is most of the world's liquid fresh water. And so when we think about um, groundwater storage, um, how water is stored underground, so water um, seeps through permeable rock um, when it rains. And so it goes through this area called the zone of aeration. Um, it stops at impermeable rock, um, which is right here. I've written in here aquaclude. Aquaclude is that barrier when it can no longer go any deeper. Um, and the water table right here, and that is the top of um, the groundwater. And so this area that's full of groundwater is called the zone of saturation. And so you'll notice in this picture, the water table is lines up with this um, river or lake bed. So if you were up here and you needed to get some groundwater, um, if you had to drill a well, you would have to drill down um, this far in order to hit that water table and um, ideally farther because this water table will fluctuate. Um, so it rises and falls depending on how much precipitation you're going to get, how much, um, how fastly it's being what's called recharged, um, and how much water is being pulled out of it. Um, so large saturated zones are called aquifers. We have several really big ones in the United States. Um, there's also little ones, but these are called aquifers. So if this was part of a large zone of saturation, um, it would be an aquifer. Um, so again, uh, the water table is at equal depths with surface bodies of water, right? So when we talked about that, that dam that was removed, um, without this water here, right, this river dropped considerably, this ground has started to sink, right? So there is that kind of level of water. Um, and again, it's important to know that these rivers and lakes are connected um, that this is surf, considered surface water, it's connected to the groundwater, right? They're part of kind of the same body of water. So if you pollute a lake or river, you can also pollute groundwater and vice versa. Um, most surface bodies of water are primarily fed by groundwater. So this lake is primarily getting its water from um, the adjacent groundwater and not from the precipitation that's uh, raining down on it. And so we have some really big um, aquifers um, in the United States. This is just a little um, display to show you. There are some really, really large ones, um, especially um, the Ogallala Aquifer, which you'll um, watch a little video about. And so we have some problems managing um, our groundwater. Um, the first is called drawdown. And so basically what happens is um, let's say that I live here and I drill a well and um, the water table was here, it was plenty of deep, and now I have kind of drawn this down, um, created this what's called a cone of depression. Now the water level has dropped and now I have to dig a new well. Um, so if you live in a, a place where you're not on city water, um, but you're getting well water, um, one of the worst things is to turn on your tap and have no water come out because that can either mean that your pump went bad or um, the much more expensive thing is that you are going to have to um, drill a new well. Um, we can also have problems with pollutant contamination, right? Let's say we have a landfill site over here. Landfills are generally um, lined so that this stuff called leachate um, which is kind of uh, what you can think of as like garbage juice. Um, so it doesn't leak out because it can be very quite toxic. Um, but landfills will often um, leak that that permeable, uh, that impermeable barrier will somehow get a hole in it. Um, and then it will get into the groundwater. It can pollute people's wells. And then, like I said, it can pollute streams. Um, we can also have problems with saltwater contamination. 
So basically, um, salt water is um, denser than fresh water because it has salt in it. So right here, right on the ocean, you tend to have this nice um, barrier where there's not a lot of mixing that's happening, right? So you're not going to get a bunch of salt water going in here because this is kind of on top of this and this is denser. Um, but if you start pumping here, you can pull this salt water into your, into your fresh water. Um, this is also going to be a problem with climate change as sea levels rise. Um, places that had freshwater wells might find salt in their wells now. Um, the next is land, land subsistence, excuse me. Um, so here is a picture uh, in the San Joaquin Valley um, where groundwater is being taken up pretty rapidly for agriculture. And what's happening is the ground is sinking. So here was the ground in 1925. Um, here was the ground in 1955. Here is the ground in 1977. So we are um, thinking, um, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, when you take that water out, just like if you took that water out behind that condent dam, that land is going to sink. Um, we also have a problem with something that's called uh, water mining. Um, so we um, are using groundwater much faster than nature can replenish it. So we have these large stores of water, um, but like a bank account, we are drawing it out faster than our paycheck is putting it back in. Um, so the Ogallala Aquifer, um, which is really, really long, long it's um, 6,000 years of rain uh, water is needed to refill that aquifer. And so there are places um, where we are dramatically depleting it, sometimes more um, than 150 feet below what it used to be. Um, we're pulling it out. It's not an endless water supply, right? We are pulling it out and that water is then we're irrigating, it's evaporating and it's winding up somewhere else. Um, so when we look at uh, groundwater trends in California, again, uh, the San Joaquin Basin, right, some uh, places have dropped um, about 9.2 feet per year, which is pretty significant. Um, I'm also going to talk about uh, hydropolitics, which is basically, like it sounds, the politics um, surrounding water, uh, right? Water does not recognize international barriers. Groundwater certainly doesn't recognize them. Uh, rivers don't recognize them, although they're often used um, as barriers. So the question is, like, who controls water, right? It's not a very discrete thing. You can own your piece of property, um, but your groundwater is connected to your neighbor's groundwater and your other neighbor's groundwater. Um, so borders pass over these very large aquifers. Um, so if you look here um, in uh, looking at Israel um, and the, the Gaza Strip, right, Israel is taking um, a huge amount of uh, groundwater, um, that is then no longer available to um, Palestinians and to um, neighboring countries. So rivers flow downstream from one country to another country. If you uh, take, um, if you dam a river upstream, you are pre then preventing people downstream from accessing that water. Um, we have um, a treaty with Mexico, because the Colorado River flows into Mexico, it ends in Mexico. Um, it doesn't actually make it all the way to the sea anymore uh, most of the time, but we have a treaty with Mexico that says we have to have a, a certain amount of water flowing to them because it's also their river. Um, so again, here you can see the Colorado River, um, which flows to the United States, um, and we draw a lot of water out of it, and it ends in Baja. So um, the treaty doesn't say anything about the quality of water that is getting to Mexico, but we have to have some water getting to Mexico. Um, also, you know, you have um, development that is rapidly draining groundwater. So Las Vegas um, has experienced a tremendous amount of urban growth um, and is still growing. It is one of the uh, fastest growing cities in the United States. Um, the development of air conditioning um, allows people to live in very, very hot places year round. Um, that might not have been developed for, but you can watch um, the adjacent water supplies shrink, right? Because most people in the United States um, want green lawns around their house, right? So suburbia um, tends to create a lot of uh, green lawns that require a lot of water, especially when you're ostensibly living in a desert. So in San Diego, um, there's been a big push for desert scaping, um, in order to kind of reduce that water footprint. Because again, although we've got a lot of water this past year, we generally don't get that much water here. So water is a renewable resource, but not everywhere or all the time, 
right? Some places are going to have more water than other places. And human beings, we now live just about everywhere. And we've gotten really good at extracting water from places, but it might not necessarily be um, replenishing. And so it can become a serious problem if it's depleted, even for a short period of time. So you can imagine if the city of Las Vegas started to run out of water, they're going to have to get water from someplace else. Um, and, and this has happened in Southern California, right, where we have started to run out of water and now we've built a desalination plant. Um, we have paid um, farmers in the in uh, east of San Diego to fallow their fields in order to get some of their water. Um, so when we look at water in um, Southern California, uh, where does our water come from in Southern California? The Colorado River um, and the San Joaquin Delta and snowpack, um, particularly in the Sierras, and you watched a little video about that um, in the last module. Um, and also now desalination, right? We have a desalination plant um, that is up and operating. Desal, um, which you'll watch a video on and see, is um, a very expensive way uh, to make water. Um, it's also pretty um, fossil fuel intensive um, and um, has kind of um, questionable environmental impacts. We also do some wastewater recycling, which is kind of that toilet to tap idea, although that's not a very nice way to put it. But if you um, if you look, uh, I'm sure you've seen signs um, possibly on campus and other places that it said, it says um, not not potable reclaimed water being used for irrigation. And so that is um, water that is now being uh, recycled to be reused in the same location. Um, we do use some from groundwater, but very, very little. So in East County, some residents um, have wells um, in order to uh, get their groundwater to get their water supply from groundwater, but very few. Um, we use it for primarily agriculture is a big one. So here's agriculture in the Imperial Valley. Um, the Imperial Valley is a great place to grow food because there's sunshine almost all the time, um, but there's not a lot of water out there, right? So you need a lot of irrigation um, in order to create that green landscape. Um, we also use it for landscaping. Um, so here are some green lawns and golf courses and Rancho Bernardo. And again, it's it's becoming in, in certain neighborhoods in San Diego, it's becoming kind of, um, you know, almost like your neighbors will scowl at you if you have a big green lawn, right? Because you're using all of this water. Where I grew up, um, you didn't really have to water your lawn. Your lawn, you could just have a lawn. And there's just enough rain to kind of replenish that lawn. You didn't have to water it all the time. Um, and then in our homes and businesses, right? Um, you're going to do something where you're going to calculate your um, water um, footprint. Um, or you'll have the opportunity to as an extra credit assignment. Um, so think about like how much water you use personally. Most of the time we just think of shower, washing dishes, washing our clothes. Um, but we use water for a lot more of it that that's kind of hidden water that we don't really think about. Um, and again, we were in a very, very big, um, drought. So this is from March, um, 29th, 2016, where, uh, most of the state was considered, um, this red is extreme, extreme drought. Um, dark red is exceptional drought, um, severe drought. So lots and lots of other than this corner that was right here. And then March of 2017, huge difference. Um, we, we are still considered to be in a drought in Southern California, um, uh, but a, a, a milder drought. And so the big question now is, is are these conditions going to last? Um, was the drought, is the drought really over or was this past year kind of just a fluke as far as precipitation goes? You're going to do an exercise coming up that's um, looking at hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing is um, a way in which um, companies get extract um, natural gas from shale deposits um, that is buried deep. And so basically what they do is they drill down and they pump in um, mostly water, but some other um, chemicals as well in order to kind of fracture this and pull out um, the natural gas, which will come back up. Um, and so there's been a lot of controversy surrounding hydraulic fracturing. Some places have banned it because they say it's polluting groundwater. Um, Hydraulic fracturing companies actually say, no, we're not polluting groundwater um, because what we're doing is well below the groundwater. Um, so you're going to watch a couple of videos surrounding that and uh, 
do an exercise. So that is the end of uh, chapter nine, and you will hear me back here for chapters 10 and 11.